So Sam, who, who's your favourite snooker player? Um, definitely John Higgins. Why is that then? Where do I start? He's a great tactician, fantastic break builder, great ambassador, amazing match player. If you were a snooker player, you'd want to be like John Higgins. In fact, from now on, I'm going to do everything like John Higgins. Here's what's coming up on the show. Matt Selt's birthday party turns out to be a huge disappointment. That here don't feel, doesn't feel any different. I wanted balloons, you know, fireworks, you know, for a long time and there was nothing really. We catch up with legendary commentator Clive Everton. There's a bombshell revelation about Lee Walker's past. I was a 70s porn star. And Dwayne Jones takes on the Great British Breakoff. First up on Bay's Watch, it's been a big year for Matthew Sell. He became a father and then he won his maiden ranking title, the Indian Open. We went to catch up with him to find out how his life has changed both on and off the table. That's not my lion. Ooh. Its ears are too soft. Overall, you know, it's, it's been the best experience of my life so far. Um, you know, just being able to see him every day, uh, well, when I'm here and uh, play with him and just watch him smile and laugh is, is worth more to me than, than anything really and it's just been an unbelievable change in emotions uh, and lifestyle as well you know I never used to get up before nine o'clock in the morning like earliest and now I'm awake before six every day and it was a bit it was a bit hard to adjust to but now it's just it's just it's the best thing ever by by quite some way had I not been able to see Parker every single day so far you know my life would be a lot worse because he just makes me smile and just you know lights up my life yeah uh when people watch snooker on TV, all they really see is players at the table potting balls and probably don't think of them so much as kind of like humans with, with different problems and different challenges. And becoming a dad kind of really brings it home, doesn't it? That, you know, that there's a lot more to life than just, just playing snooker. Yeah, uh, I mean, up until when Parker was born, I didn't really see myself as a human. You know, I was more like a snooker nerd. You know, I still, I, I love the game. I'll put everything into the game. But now Parker's come along, it's brought a different dimension to my life and snooker's not the be all or end all. Uh, but it's obviously a major part of my life and, and a massive love I have for the game. Uh, but you know, it doesn't come first anymore. It always was first up until since the age of 14. Uh, but now it's second. You know, being a good, a good parent and a good dad is more important than anything. Just looking back on India, then incredible landmark for you, fantastic achievement. Um, go, flying over to India, did you feel like there was something in the tank there? Did you go there thinking that you know big things could happen for me? I actually thought I was going to win in the semis and final. I, I messaged my wife and said, I think I could win this in the quarterfinals, but then in the semis and finals, I had a feeling that I was going to win it. And that's what made it, I was super calm and it made it very enjoyable because I was not nervous at all. I, like, I really enjoyed the feeling of the pressure. It was really good and that's the first time I've experienced that. And beating Higgins in the, in the semi-finals, one of your all-time heroes, does that make it extra special? Uh, absolutely. You know, I could have won a tournament had Higgins got beat and I'd have beaten someone else. You know, you come away and you go, uh, not that it makes a difference, but people go, oh, you know, he's won the Indian Open, you know, who's he beat? You go, well, to me, I, go, oh, I don't really care, mate. I'm not interested in what you think. I've won. In the, but now, you know, I've beaten probably the second play, best player of all time in the semi finals. I don't care how bad he's playing, if he's interested, if he's snooker depression, whatever. He's there in the semi finals of the tournament. He's not gone to India for the crack, so he's gone there to win. So for me to beat him, and I outplayed him as well. I missed a couple of balls, but I, I played really well. Uh, so yeah, of course he makes it extra special and just to, to get the words that he sent, he, you know, he sent me a text off and just the words he said to me after, you know, that's what, that's what I play the game for, to, for my peers to, you know, pass down some kind words like that, really. The, the only thing I remember the most was when the lights come on after I'd won, Peter Ebden come straight up to me because he watched the whole game, you know, shook my head and said, listen, Matt, well done, I'm really pleased for you, uh, you know, fantastic. And, and, that meant more, that didn't mean more to me than winning, but the things like that, you know, it meant a lot to me because me, I've got a lot of respect for Pete. I've watched him growing up when I was a kid <clears throat> and I've always been pretty close to him. So 
for someone of that ilk to be watching the final and to come and say something to me after was, you know, I, I won't forget that. You know, we play this game and, uh, you know, the money comes in, the money goes out, like I said earlier, but, you know, I've got a little boy and, you know, when, when he grows up, he'll say, oh, you know, your dad, what does he do? I play snooker, he doesn't play snooker. I did it, oh, you know, what did he ever win? Well, at least he could say, no, you know, he, he won something. You know, he won the Indian Open. Clive Everton has been the voice of snooker for over 40 years. Now his achievements, both as a commentator and as a journalist, have been recognised by the Queen, with him being awarded an MBE. We went up to the snooker scene headquarters in Birmingham to meet the man himself. Well, Clive, an incredible honour to be awarded with an MBE. It, just how much of a surprise was it for you when, when the letter came through to show you got it? Very pleasant surprise. Uh, it's very rare that somebody who's been instinctively anti-establishment all his life, uh, uh, or, or even it's pretty rare for a journalist to get, get an honour like this, but uh, I, I, I take it as, a, in some ways, a recognition of snooker. So I, I, was, I was very pleased. It was something I didn't expect. And uh, obviously it'll be a, a, a brilliant occasion going down to Buckingham Palace. Just how much are you looking forward to, to doing that in October? Well, apparently I can take my wife and my, my grown-up children, so uh, it'll be quite a day. And uh, have you put any thought into what you might say to the Queen or what she might have to say to you? Well, uh, I won't speak before I'm spoken to. <laughs> well, you always get a special feeling when you're on the verge of something that's obviously going to be his, his story. This is it. <laughs> it's the storybook ending. He wins the title with his thousandth century. And then uh, you, you get excited, but the, the next emotion is don't mess it up. <laughs> Snooker scenes. Arguably, your, your biggest legacy is snooker. How, you know, how proud are you of, of the history of snooker and, and the fact that it's still ongoing today? Very proud. I think it is probably my most major contribution to snooker because any sport needs a journal of record, which we've tried to be, and still are trying to be. But it also needs to supply a, an independent view of the issues which arise in the game. And in the case of snooker, uh, there was a lot of campaigning to do to get the game better run. Basically, the things that we campaigned against don't happen anymore. And the game has really been transformed since Barry Hearn came into World Snooker. And um, Jason Ferguson took over as chairman of the, of the WPBSA. I shall keep bashing on and uh, I hope to complete 50 years as editor uh, in about 18 months time. I still like commentating and I'll be doing it for as long as anybody will have me. O'Sullivan, first in with 60 in the decider. Oh, I've this picture. Do you want that one? No. I can't find it, are we? No, no. When was it? Right, this is by far my favourite picture. It's a picture of me and Polly, obviously after I'd won Northern Ireland. Polly was only quite young, really liked that picture. So that's uh, one of my favourite pictures, uh, me and my wife at uh, a fancy dress party. I was a 70s porn star. This is my favourite picture. This is my grandson, Roman. He's my hero. It's a lot, a lot of text from Mark. Uh, every time we play, he tells me to bring my gloves. My white gloves is from picking the balls up for him. No, no one again, I, uh, I hand them over to him, but uh, not, not very often lately. It's me in, back in 2016, uh, February, where I picked up my first major world ranking title, uh, the German Masters. Uh, I always looked at and listened to dance classics from the from the era, the early 2000s, late 90s. Uh, obviously, Faithless Insomnia is a big tune. 
uh, in my heart. Obviously, great memories. Thinking back of the Crucible and uh, the German Masters walking out there, you know, the crowd loved it, and uh, now it was a special feeling. Dancing on my own, Callum Scott. When I was at the Masters, I think Barry hadn't taken over that long. We need to spice it up a bit, and players need to be a bit more outgoing, and blah, blah, blah. So we picked the song, obviously, Ice Cube. I decided to come out and do a really silly dance, which um, my 70 year old son keeps digging at me for. And, you know, when we're out in company, he decides to put it on YouTube and just mug me straight off. Well, this picture was taken a good few years ago now, somewhere in Germany. Can't remember what tournament it was. As you can see, I'm not exactly small, but this guy just makes me look like a midget. There's a lot of people going up asking him for photos rather than the players. So here we have a, a certain shot that, you know, does actually come up quite often in snooker. Um, you know, one of the priorities in snooker is to try and pop the red and always land top side of the blue. Obviously all of the reds, are, the majority of the time are on this end of the table. So um, this is key to land this side of the blue. But obviously if you haven't, um, one of the common shots is, you know, to try and force the white around the angles, around the back of the bulk colors and um, try and land back in position on the reds down this end of the table. So um, for this shot, I'm gonna be playing with a lot of top spin, um, a bit of left hand side to try and widen the angle. So plenty of top spin and left hand side and you know, hopefully got back into position. Last month, David Gilbert set our Great British Break Off record, potting all 10 reds. Can German Masters semi finalist Dwayne Jones match him? I'm Dwayne Jones and this is the Great British Break Off. I was expecting worse than that. <laughs> So that's it for this month's episode of Bay's Watch. Hope you've enjoyed it. I'm off to the World Cup now in Wuxi. 24 teams battle for glory. You can watch it live on Eurosport. Hi Barry, it's Sam here. Um, there's no sign of this helicopter. Is it coming? No, uh, I mean, I sold it to my mate Stuart Wood and then I had to get it back. Sorry about that.
Uh, yeah, so, yeah. so Sam, who's your favourite snooker player? This one is good. Uh, definitely John Higgins. <laughs> <laughs> so Sam, who's your favourite snooker player? <laughs>